All right, now that we have uh, propositions, being these declarative sentences that are either true or false, but not both, and we have ways to write them, either literally write it out or literally uh, uh, take it and say, I don't know what the proposition is, so we'll just give it a name, we'll call it a variable. And then we can do truth tables that represent them in terms of whether or not they're true or false. As we get to these operations and uh, the symbols themselves, if we would have, like most things in terms of variables, uh, variables can be either an assignment or left unassigned. And so we could do things like if it represents a specific uh, assignment, say specific names. So for example, say P denotes, and that's what this particular thing means, the sentence, uh, uh, my name is Paul. That's a specific name where I, I, I assign a symbol to represent that. And this is basically the idea of a shorthand way of dealing with the proposition. You know, instead of writing the entire thing each time, my name is Paul, my name is Paul, my name is Paul, I'm just going to write P, and it means my name is Paul. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of the variables themselves, if it would be the idea of an open variable or basically uh, P is any proposition, and then I don't know what it is. I'm just going to say it represents any proposition. So typically when I deal with variables, we'll do specific names or we'll just simply say it represents any proposition at all. And if it represents any particular proposition, Normally the way that we would visualize it is not to state the actual thing. We would say things like, okay, let's go ahead and make a truth table and say P is either going to be true or it's going to be false because all possible propositions just fall into these two types. Uh, note on the naming type. If I want to take a symbolic representation of something, and I could say things like, uh, if you know of a specific proposition. So, for example, if I was given a the bear eats. Um, popcorn. So, a bear says the bear eats popcorn. Like if that's either true, you see the bear, it's either eating popcorn or not popcorn at the time. And we would have that, and it's like, what would be a good name? <laughs> right? Now, typically the book will just simply use P, Q's, and R's. It will do things like, okay, P denotes the bear eats popcorn, right? That's typically, this is kind of how the book does it. On the other hand, uh, it might be better to rather say, well, you know what, what matters, the bear is the object, but really what we're talking about is eating popcorn, right? And so maybe it would be better to say simply, say E denotes the bear eats popcorn because the E represents this idea of the eating, and so I'm thinking of eating popcorn when I see the E. And so maybe it'd be better to pick a good variable name that's associated with the predicate, you know, the object that, what is this gonna be true or false, eating popcorn. So let's, let's focus on the predicate a little bit. Maybe it would be best to do what we normally do in programming, which is pick a variable name that makes sense. Instead of using, and since I have the ability to write longer thing, uh, why don't I just simply say eat, or maybe eat underscore popcorn <laughs> denotes the bear eats popcorn, right? That would make a lot more sense to simply say, okay, let's pick a variable name, like a programmer would pick a variable name so that when I see it, eat underscore popcorn, or maybe capital, do camel, eat popcorn right? Name the variable in a way that 
I am replacing an entire proposition with a symbol. Well, why don't we pick symbols that are not seemingly uh, completely unassociated like P, Q, and R. Maybe we should pick maybe something based upon the object, maybe E, but it'd probably be better to try and, or best to pick long variable names that are associated with it. But that just, you know, obviously if you don't want to write a lot, you wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, but that's just the kind of a hint to, you know, picking good names as you do the work from here on out. All right, now that we have these things, how do I form what's called compound propositions or basically what, how can I use operations? On propositions to make what's called compound propositions. Okay, the idea is, well, what's an operation? Well, if I have a declarative sentence and another declarative sentence, I need to make a declarative sentence that involves those declarative sentences. Might seem odd, but really uh, an example would be how I started out. If you get A's on your homework and get A's on your exams and get A's on your final, then I will give you an A for the course. That entire complicated thing is made up of many smaller propositions. You get an A on your homework you get an A on your exam one, you get an A on your exam two. All of that stuff are like smaller propositions that are put together with words like if, and, then. And I notice that as I, as I use the human language that there are manipulators of these basic things that make new things. Like for example, one plus two is three. I took my old two numbers with a thing I call addition that forms a new number, three as I build them out. So what sorts of things work on these English sentences that are true or false, but not both? And so what are my operations? Well, the first one that I'll talk about is the easiest, which is negation. All right, negation is the little kid rule, right? Which is if I say, you're stupid, and then the little kid says, not, well, what did he just do? <laughs> if you are stupid, was true and then he says not he just made it false but if you are stupid was false and he says not then it makes it true so negation takes a proposition and flips its truth value and so the way that we would do this is it's an operator but it has to be a sentence and so how do I do this this is going to be just simply it is not the case that and then P is whatever sentence you were talking about. Symbolically, the symbols of this operator are just simply not P. It's kind of like a minus sign because it's flipping it like a minus does. And so we do a little variation of a minus and this is read as not P. And now on the other hand, it's actually read as it is not the case that, and then you just simply replace. So if I, if I would say my name is Mark, then it is not the case that my name is Mark, which flips that is going to be the negation of if my name is Mark is true, it is not the case that my name is Mark becomes false. If my name if I, my name is Mark was false, it is not the case that my name is Mark would become true. So negation just simply flips the truth value. All right, the second one that we'll talk about would be something like well, I used in the one which is if you get an A in here and you get an A in here, then it have that word and, and so and is going to be called conjunction. Symbolically, this is P, and that's a bridge symbol Q. This is read as P, and then there's simply the English word Q. So whatever compound proposition, then the English word and, and the second compound proposition. Uh, the third operator we'll talk about is disjunction, which is also called the inclusive or. And this is P with a V symbol Q. This is read as P or Q. I'm going to immediately jump to the next guy, 4, which is called the exclusive or, which is P O plus Q. And this is also read as P or Q. Well, wait a second. <laughs> or, or? Yes, English has one sound, or, 
that has two meanings. And the easy example on this would be uh, this guy here, where if a person would say, you take a spoon or you take a fork, and what you mean is, so if I walk up to somebody, would you like a fork or a spoon, right? Fork or spoon, and you take both, I'm okay with that, right? That's inclusive. I allow you to do both. But on the other hand, if I would say, you take soup or you take salad, right, and you take both, I would say, that's wrong. I did not want you to take it. So the exclusive or is more, is the or of what a proposition is. It's either true or false, but not both. When in doubt, you can turn an inclusive into an exclusive or using the word or by saying, but not both. So this guy is the but not both. It's P or Q, but not both. And so when in doubt, use P or Q, but not both, right? So that you, if you don't understand which or it is, oh, I don't know, is it inclusive or exclusive? Say it, <laughs> but not both. Oh, you mean exclusive. So if you're confused on what word or is, you would do that. When there is no confusion, just simply say P or Q, let them figure it out from context. All right, so we've got negation, conjunction, disjunction, exclusive or. The other example that I had about your bad grades, getting Fs or As, I started off with the word if. That is the conditional. The conditional symbolically is P arrow Q. Now this is read as normally if P then Q. On the other hand, if you read chapter six of the book, you're going to notice that there is a half page of ways of saying this operation. If P then Q is the same thing as P only if Q. So if we would look at this, the left-hand side, the object on the left, would be the if object. It's also the sufficient object. The thing on the right is the only if object. It is also the necessary object. And there are other ways of saying that, but those are kind of the primary ways that I normally, that most people normally talk about it. And so the conditional is, if this is met, then you do the following, right? Now. We'll talk about what this operation does here in a little bit when we do the truth values on it, but this is political seasons. We can talk a bit. This would be like, if you elect me, then I will give you a chicken. So elect me is one proposition, giving a chicken is a second proposition as we put it together. And the last one that we can talk about is the biconditional, which would be P double arrow Q, which is read as P if and only if Q. And this guy acts as, you know, P implies Q, Q implies, whoops, there's missing a N for some reason. So if I have an arrow going away, that makes this the if part. If the arrow is coming back, this makes this the only, only if part. So P, if and only if Q. So they both have arrows going to them. The idea of the biconditional is the idea of like a comparator. In other words, I would like this idea of same, which actually kind of gets to the point of, oh, I bet I have to use this to talk about what it means to be the same because sameness, this would be kind of a check, right? True if and only if true, false if only if false would make sense. So we try to make it, this seems to be a comparator that I could possibly use. Given those operations, we finally get to part that's definitely on the first test it always does things like that and I just say it this way is the truth table everyone should know which is the following if I have two propositions P and Q the possibilities are true true false false true false true false and then what I do is what are all the operations that I could do I could do a not P I could do a not Q I could do a P or Q I could do a P or Q I could do a P and Q I could do an if P then Q I could do P if and only if Q right so what I want people to do on this truth table that everybody should know is be able to understand and do every operation now this is important because from here on out, we build on logic. 
And if you do not know every operation and what every operation does and why it does what it does, this makes absolutely no sense. So this is not the idea of memorizing where T's and F's go. What this means is why is this true and why is this false and what is going on on my problem? That's what I mean is like you can make the table, yes, but you understand the table is more important. So for example, if P is true, true, false, false, what does the negation do? It just flips those truth values. If it was true, negating it will flip it to false. If it was false, it'll flip it to true. What was Q? Is true, false, true, false. What negating it's going to do? It's going to go false, true, false, true. All right. So I understand what negation does. If it was true, it makes it false. If it was true, it makes it false. If it was false, it makes it true. That's all negation is. All right. What's the or? Well, this is the inclusive or. All right. So if you take the fork or you take the spoon, I'm okay with that. If you take the fork and you take no spoon, I'm still okay with that. If you don't take the fork, but you take the other, I'm okay with that. But on the other hand, if you take no utensils, no, I'm not okay with that. You're going to, you're not going to eat with your fingers, right? If you tell the truth or you tell the truth, it's the truth. If you tell the truth or you lie, you still have told the truth because this is an or statement. Now, one of the things that happens is if I look at this, notice that true dominates. In this problem, if there's ever a true, hey, there's a true, that's a true. Hey, there's a true, that's a true. There's two trues, still true, both false, right? Notice that whenever there's a truth, truth will dominate. Now, this isn't unusual, right? Under operations of math type systems, like for example, under multiplication, what's five times zero? Uh, it's zero. What's a hundred times zero? It's zero. It's negative a million times zero. It's zero multiplicatively of numbers zero dominates well same thing here under logic under the operation of or true dominates if you ever have a true true dominates and so it just when's the only time you get a false when everything's false so if i have a bunch of ors if they're a true anywhere the entire thing is true it's only going to be false if everybody is false so what about the exclusive or well go back to the super salad. If you try to take both of them at the same time, that's not, that is not good. If you take the soup, yes. If you take the salad, yes. On the other hand, if you take, if you say or, and you said you were going to do it, uh, that's false as well, right? You're, you're the aggressive parent. You got to eat, pick, the, eat the soup or eat the salad. If you do neither, that's bad. Notice here under exclusive or there's no dominator, right? So not everything has dominators. There's no additive dominator, right? Something plus does not dominate it. So just like here, an exclusive or there isn't a dominator. What about and? Well, if I tell the truth and I tell the truth, I have told you the truth. But if I tell you the truth and I lie, I've lied. If I lie and then tell the truth, I have still lied. And if I lie twice, I have still lied. Notice here that false dominates. So if I use words like you get an A on your exam one, and you get an A on your exam two, and you get an A on exam three, and you get an A on exam four, right? If at any time you don't get an A, false, the entire thing's false. Because I said and. You must, you get an A and an A and an A. If you fail that, one failure, the entire system is false. It's only true when they're all true, which makes absolute sense because we're modeling things that are. Implication. Well, this is a testing event. So the left is considered sufficient and the right is called necessary. Why? Why would this be called necessary? Well, let's go back to the election. If you elect me, then I give you a chicken. Well, if you do elect me, right, that's actually happened. If you elect me and then I give you a chicken, well, I'm a truthful politician. It was, but on the other hand, if you elect me and I don't give you a chicken, you would say you're a liar. Why is it necessary? Well, look at this. True, false, true, false. What's happening is if I get elected, it is absolutely necessary that I do what I said I do or else I'm a liar, right? That's why it's called necess it's necessary. But on the other hand, what happens if you don't elect me? Well, if you don't elect me, how can I lie? 
right? That's vacuous. I mean, it's, it's the same thing as programming. If you don't meet that first condition, just skip it. It's impossible to have been a lie, so it's just simply true, right? You're not a liar because you didn't elect me. If you didn't elect me, fine. It's just going to be true. These two truths here are called a vacuous truth. And so going through those particular problems, this is important. False implies anything is true. Always. It's a vacuous truth. Why? Because the condition has not been met. Skip it. You didn't lie. You're fine. And so that's vacuously true. Do, 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 skip back. All right. What about the biconditional? Well, the biconditional just checks. Are they both true? Yep. Are they both false? Yep. Are they exactly the same? Nope. That's what if and only if means. So and when we would look at this, we can say, okay, what's conditional? It's this idea of gateway. What is the biconditional? It's an idea of a comparator. And why are there so many falses under and? Because false dominates. Why is there so many trues under or? Because true dominates under or. What does negation do? It flips. You have to understand how all of the logic works on un all of the English sentences. And so, yes, these are symbolic representations, but they're symbolic representations of actual conversations using declarative sentences that are true or false, but not both. Now, if we mix them up into a larger compound proposition, we could do things like, it is not the case that P and Q implies P or not Q, right? So I would have things of this nature where, you know, if P is like my name, uh, my name is Paul, Q is I run quickly. It is not the case that my name is Paul and I run quickly implies that my name is Paul or it is not the case that I run quickly. Now, it seems awkward, but yeah, that's fine. But it's a compound proposition. And so it's one of the things about building out logic and reasoning in these gaming systems is that you start to learn how to formalize what you say and what you mean, because these things are modeling things that are true conversations that are either true or false. And people mess around and try to add a lot of stuff and work with it and get to the point where now we can actually truly study. Why is this true? Why is this a lie? Now, when I look at this, it's going to get to the idea of, well, I have a bunch of operations together. So just like college algebra, we have the idea of order of operations. And the order of operations is who goes first. And the who goes first is, and this will go as in order, would be first would be grouping. So the first thing we have is grouping. And so I have parentheses, and I can have lots of different parentheses, right? We can have brackets and curly brackets, right? Some sort of grouping symbol to let me know, handle inside the parentheses first. The next thing you do below grouping is and or exclusive or. And after that is, whoops, uh, let's move this down. Do, 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 do. Get rid of that. Oops, I'm missing one operator. Go back. Do, 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 do. Next is negation. After negation is and or an exclusive or, and after that is imply and the biconditional. Now, one, as you do this, uh, the book does make the ands and the ors and the not ors in different orders as you're going through it. One of the things about this is they try to make like and before or, and they don't even have the exclusive or. The important feature of this is I would not necessarily naturally trust order of operations. Normally what you would do is overuse grouping. In other words, when in doubt, use grouping symbols. All right, so 
that's how we go through the order of operations. And next, what we'll do is we'll actually make some truth tables involving, you know, these things and build them out.